I got to think about it. Um, and it's an argument I made in my book, but rather than just like summarize the book, because I was tempted to do that, because that'd be easy, I found some stuff that was uh, laying around that I didn't make it in the book, but actually is a way to talk about the things in the book from another angle. So that's kind of what I'm going to do today. Um, all right, so there is a story about the beat poet Allen Ginsberg that's right there, during the Chicago riots of 1968. While the riots raged, Ginsburg chanted Om for seven hours in hopes of calming everyone down. At one point, an Indian gentleman passed him a note that said his pronunciation was all wrong. <laughs> in her chapter on Hindus in America, historian of religion Winnie Doniger cited this story as emblematic of the American encounter with Hinduism. Uh, for her, the story about Ginsburg crystallized the story of Hinduism uh, crystallized the uh, story of Hinduism in America. It was a story about, quote, the question of the degree to which other Americans, too, have gotten a lot more than the pronunciation of Om all wrong, and who is the best judge of that. For Doniger, Hinduism moved from India to the United States, where Americans understood it better or worse. As she wrote at the close of her chapter, quote, I believe that the wild misconceptions that most Americans have of Hinduism need to be counteracted precisely by making Americans aware of the richness and human depth of Hindu texts and practices. Hinduism in America for Doniger was a story of understanding and misunderstanding. Taking a slightly different tack, uh, Vasudha Narayanan has described two ways to study Hinduism in America. Quote, the history of ideas and practices that are derived from Hindu traditions, but may not explicitly use the term Hindu, and then on the other hand, the history of Hindus in this country. So for Narayanan, both of these things, the ideas and practices and the, and the Hindu immigrants traveled to America. Narayanan's and Doniger's approaches to the history of Hindus in America share a common core assumption. There was a thing out there in the world called Hinduism, and it somehow made its way to the United States, either as practices and texts or as people. I write about this in places as what I call the, the uh, the box idea of Hinduism. The Hinduism is like a box, a crate. You can just put on a boat and ship over. Um, and what happens is, you know, after 1965, when immigration rules changed the United States and large numbers of South Asians begin to immigrate, that story of immigration, of people on boats coming over here or airplanes coming over here, gets backwards read onto things like texts and practices and ideas and images. And so we have this idea that it's a box that floated over earlier, right? And I think it's more like a smash of pieces of driftwood. So we'll talk about the driftwood uh, today. So Allen Ginsberg chanting Om on the streets of Chicago was an example of how Hinduism came to America. And one American misunderstood it until corrected by a friendly Indian that he ran into. There's another story about Ginsberg chanting, however. Um, in 1969, during the conspiracy trial that followed the Chicago riots, as he testified about his role in the Chicago protests, he answered the prosecutor's question by beginning to chant Om again. After two Oms, the prosecutor objected. I have no objection to the two Oms that we have, heard, we have had. However, I just didn't want it to go on all day, he said. <laughs> the two, however you characterize what the witness did, may remain of record, and he may not continue in the same vein, the judge replied. When asked if he had finished his answer to the original question, Ginsburg meekly replied, I'm afraid I will be in contempt if I continue to Om. But Ginsburg would chant Om one more time while on the stand that day. When a defense attorney and the judge got into a shouting match, he bellowed out Om in a voice like a cello. As an edited transcript described it, a climactic moment in Ginsburg's testimony, Mr. Kunstler had indeed raised his voice, so had Judge Hoffman. The atmosphere was extremely tense, with marshals on the alert and the courtroom itself verging on chaos. Suddenly, Ginsburg began to chant and the courtroom was instantly silenced. So I relate these various moments of a beat poet chanting to point out that worrying about Ginsburg's pronunciation completely misses the point. Whether or not he pronounced Ohm correctly fails to account for why Ginsburg would chant Ohm in the middle of a riot to begin with. Ginsburg testified that he chanted so the crowd in Lincoln Park would feel, quote, a calm, a feeling of ease and relaxation to, eliminate relax relaxation to eliminate tension, to eliminate anxiety, to eliminate hysteria, 
to eliminate the hallucination of scary images of police. The chanting happened within the context of political protests, police violence, the Democratic National Convention, and the Vietnam War. In the courtroom, Ginsburg's chanting became a point of conflict between the state and protesters as the prosecutor kept objecting to it over and over again. Placed in the larger context of social, social conflict swirling in 1968 and 1969, the accuracy of Ginsburg, Ginsburg's pronunciation is beside the point. Ginsburg had spent time studying yoga and chanting in India. He had sat in Zazen in Japan, but his chanting in Lincoln Park and in a federal courtroom tells us more about the conflicts going on in the United States at the end of the 1960s than it does anything about Hinduism. Rather than labeling Ginsburg's own as a story of Hinduism in America and its misunderstanding, I argue that scholars would be better off seeing it as yet another example of how Americans have drawn on India as a source in their ongoing conflicts about what it means to be an American. Nowhere in Ginsburg's testimony did he mention Hinduism or even the word Hindu. At one point he defended playing an Indian harmonium as part of his testimony because, quote, it adds spirituality to the case, sir. I don't know why I put it in there, just like that quote. Uh, for Ginsburg, <laughs> Om was not Hindu. It was not part of Hinduism. It was an exotic resource outside of American culture that he deployed to critique American culture as he saw it. The police kicked over campfires and shot tear gas. Ginsburg chanted Om. Americans turned to India for ammunition in their culture wars generations before Allen Ginsburg. Throughout the 19th century, Americans used representations of the Indian other and religion in India, variously described as, there's a lot of scare quotes in this talk, heathen, Hindu, Brahmanism, Hindu religion, or religion of the Hindus, to name just a few terms, uh, and their arguments over what it meant to be a Christian or an American. Descriptions of those people over there in India worked as evidence and arguments about what it meant to be one of us over here in America. I have fleshed this argument out in my book, He Then Hindu Hindu, available on Amazon, published this fall by Oxford, and in that book I analyzed examples ranging from evangelical missionary magazines to theosophical writers to transcendentalists to school textbooks to trace the variety of representations of religion in India that Americans put to use. I also argue that to categorize all of these myriad representations of, Indi of India under the heading Hinduism is to fail to see that none of the Americans I studied used that term or thought there was a Hinduism that functioned as a world religion comparable to Christianity or Islam or Judaism or any other isms. Scholars who do classify these representations as Hinduism in America do so anachronistically. Henry David Thoreau was not inspired by Hinduism, though he did read the Bhagavad Gita. So first, a note about words and pronunciations. So like Ginsburg, you may be a bit taken aback by my pronunciation or the writing, because I think it is important to pay careful attention to the words and categories American writers use to describe India and what they think the people there are doing. Today I will talk about Hindus with two O's and heathens when the sources do. Not because these are accurate, again, it's not about the right pronunciation of home, but because these are the categories the sources use, and tracing how these categories change reveals how these representations function in American culture. Furthermore, it's important to note that what an American writer in 1851 or 1823 or wherever, 18 whatever, described as Hindu religion looks nothing like what a self-described Hindu with a U would recognize as Hinduism today. And I don't think they are the same. And I think it's interesting that they're not the same. Rather than rehash the examples that I've written about in the book, today I'll turn to three examples from the 19th, same 19th century period that did not make it into the book. Think of this as a sort of deleted scenes on the bonus disc of the DVD. Uh, for grad students in the room, this is what happens to seminar papers. It's six years later they become talks at Wisconsin. Um, what, <laughs> Which what, is a good thing. That is a good, it's great. Yeah. Um, what, uh, I had a professor, old professor, now retired, once say, like, you take, you know, you take at least ten seminars in grad school, staple those papers together, that's your dissertation. <laughs> What unites these three examples is their shared theme of the body, medicine, and disease. American medicine came of age during the 19th century, transitioning from a period of, period of folk healing and pseudoscience and unlicensed practitioners to a professional and scientific field by the end of the century. 
So I'll turn to three examples in that history and connect them to the larger claims and sources I make in the book about representations of India and American cult culture. The three examples I have today are cholera, phrenology, and a medical club in New York called the Charaka Club. All right? So let's begin with cholera. This is a, a, a British uh, uh, etching from 1832. It was widely reprinted and circulated. Everything, just know everything that I talk about just got reprinted and stolen constantly because there was no copyright laws. And people wanted, to, there was this boom of printing both in America and Britain. So that's sort of the background of all this. In the 19th century, cholera was an Asian disease, right? And it was specifically, it was called Asian cholera after all. And specifically, it was an Indian disease. <coughs> Epidemic cholera originated in, in India and spread through the networks connecting colonial India to the rest of the world. For early European writers about cholera, as one recent historian remarked, quote, global cholera was simply an unfortunate byproduct of bringing India into the world. Cholera was an Indian disease, but a European concept. Indeed, early writers even pointed to a cholera deity they, they believed they saw in Lower Bengal, the source of the epidemics, named Bula Bibi. Of course, they did not pay attention to whether that deity was new or had been there for centuries. They just believed it had been there since forever. From the beginning, Europeans saw a connection between India's disease and India's religion. Mm. The first cholera epidemic that attracted British attention in India began in 1818. Cholera did not reach the United States until 1832. But this period between 1818 and 1832 coincides with the first generation of American <coughs> evangelical missionaries who traveled to India under the auspices of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, or the ABCFM. Now, I say evangelical, I mean that as a way to separate these New England Protestants from the liberal ones, like the Unitarians, right? And we'll talk about Unitarians in a minute. But I do not mean that these were all, like, Jerry Falwell. Like, this is specific, I'm trying to be very specific because I hate the word evangelical, but it works for me here to separate this certain kind of Protestant I'm talking about. The kind of Protestant that would send people to India. Um, so the ABCFM was based in New England, and it sent missionaries steeped in, this, in a Calvinist doctrine known as the New Divinity, that emphasized a, quote, disinterested benevolence that all Christians should feel toward every human created by God. This benevolence should motivate Christians to take action in the world that would extend God's kingdom and bring God glory. Hence, the ABCFM sent missionaries, sent reports home, and then a network of evangelical newspapers and missionary magazines circulated these reports throughout New England. They had their own magazine that, that was then stolen from by a local magazine and up and down, really, from about New York to uh, up through like New England, Connecticut, it was all over the place. But it's basically places where the ABCFM had uh, connection. So thus, American evangelical readers encountered cholera as an Indian disease in missionary reports long before it ever reached American shores. In these early missionary reports, cholera functioned uh, as an event for missionaries to present Hindu superstition and heathenism to their audience at home. Uh, ABCFM missionary Gordon Hall described how, in the wake of the epidemic, quote, whole villages have been depopulated, that sufficient persons could not be procured to dispose of the dead, and that there was nobody left to cultivate the ground. He then declared, what is all this when compared with, these, with those awful ravages which spiritual death has spread over the whole face of this immense country, sweeping away into eternity one whole generation after another in uninterrupted succession for so many centuries. Hall immediately moved from the physical death of cholera to the spiritual death of so-called Hindu heathenism. The two were connected for him. Both had swept across the subcontinent, and both needed physical healing from outsiders, be it missionaries or doctors. Other missionaries noted how the cholera epidemic drove the Hindus to turn to their so-called idolatry rather than the Christian God. American John Nichols' journal, which was published throughout New England, recorded, quote, I've just returned from Kulian. The cholera morbus rages terribly in the Concan. I learned that 12 of the school's boys have lately lost relatives, of course, for 10 days after, were ceremonially unclean, and do not attend school. The Hindus, when visited with this dreadful malady, know no remedy but the worship of devils. Likewise, another missionary declared that the cholera drove the Hindus to their idols. Quote, it makes them more earnest in their adoration of their idols and frequently gives rise to new idols. They think this particular calamity to be a god. In 
from this crude notion they give it a form and endeavor to appease it, like its anger by prostrations and offerings. The idea that the cholera not only is something that pushes these people towards so-called idolatry, but that it actually causes more idolatry, right, is behind all this. Epidemic cholera function as an occasion for missionaries to present to American readers the epidemic of Hindu superstition that they also is also in the continent. Throughout the 1820s, missionaries presented cholera in India to American readers as another example of Hindu superstition and death and the, the, and the death, both physical and spiritual, they believed accompanied the religion of the Hindus. The worship of the gods toward of cholera accompanied other images of so-called bloody Hindu religions, such as the death of pilgrims worshiping the so-called juggernaut at Puri, Sati, and hook swinging, hook swinging. These images of death and superstition were central to calls by the missionary societies for funds and people to go to India. But they were also some of the earliest widespread representations of India and religion in India in American culture. This comes from the ABCFM's uh, magazine, the, uh, and it's their sort of monthly magazine. And it's an engraving of uh, what Jagannath, but was anglicized into Juggernaut. Um, and the missionaries would claim that as this cart was being pulled during the ritual, there that uh, devotees would throw themselves under its wheels and be crushed to death, and it was this image of a sort of death. You even see the juggernaut being deployed as a metaphor by the 1830s, where there's a temperance article I found where they talk about alcohol as a juggernaut. Um, uh, so there's uh, so there's this, and then this image, this came from a, a book, uh, I'm not going to talk about it, but Dr. Scudder's Tales for Little Readers about the Heathen. Um, this is a common image, this is 1849 when this was printed, but it's been around since the 1820s, uh, maybe even earlier in the print stuff, of uh, a woman throwing her baby to into the Ganges for the... So, Belief for the gods. This is an important image. Hold this one. Uh, we're going to come back to this in a, from, a, from another angle uh, in a little bit. Um, so, in 1832, cholera reached, cholera reached the shores of America. In his cultural history of the 19th century cholera epidemics in America, historian Charles Rosenberg emphasized the religious explanations Americans brought to the cholera in their country. Quote, it was a consequence of sin. Man had infringed upon the laws of God, and cholera was an inevitable and inescapable judgment. Most Americans did not doubt that cholera was a divine imposition. There is, of course, some irony here. The same Northeastern Protestants who read about the heathen Hindus turning to their gods when the cholera raged claimed the disease on their own god when it came to the United States. The experience of cholera at home changed the way American Protestants wrote about cholera in India. The difference between Hindus and Americans shifted from one of merely a religion, which could be overcome by conversion, to one of nationality and national identity. Uh, an 1837 article from New York's Children's Magazine titled "What the Hindus Think of the Cholera" is an early was an early example of this change. The article did not appear in a missionary magazine, but in one of the growing number of family oriented popular magazines aimed at the growing middle class. These magazines blended Protestant morality with American nationalism in order to give American women and children a proper American cultural identity. Harper's Monthly Magazine, which began in 1851, is sort of the go-to example of this, but Ladies' Goatee Book, there's a whole bunch that come about um, in this period. So this article in 1837 uh, began by reminding readers of the recent epidemic and the American reaction to it. But we know that it was God who sent this disorder upon us, and that he knew what was best for us and could take it away when he pleased. So we prayed to him with all our hearts, and he heard our prayers, and the cholera was taken away from us. The article then turned to how the Hindus explained cholera, and moved through a story given to a traveler by a Brahmin about a goddess Mariama and a god Sira. Sira gave Mariama the power to kill men, and this power was actually cholera. The article concluded by teaching the young readers, and their mothers reading it to them, to, quote, be thankful that we know better, and both in health and in sickness, let us pray to our God and put our trust in him. Yes, I'm emphasizing the we's, us, and ours in this, right? This article was not aimed at convincing readers to work for the salvation of the Hindus. There were no calls, lamentable calls for the problems that could be solved by more missions. It was not meant to raise funds or inspire the young readers to pledge to become missionaries. The article rendered Hindus as locked in ignorance, and they 
functioned as a foil against which to construct a Protestant American identity for the reader. We know who we are as Americans by comparing ourselves to them over there in India. Throughout the 19th century, publications aimed at children in the domestic sphere, such as school books and popular magazines, represented India as a land of despotic, dark, heathen Hindus, in contrast to democratic, white, Protestant Christians. And the despotic side was both in terms of history of uh, rule, but also uh, caste functions as an image of, of despotism and anti-democracy. The Hindu function as an other for constructing American national identity. As the century wore on and cholera epidemics broke out across the United States, in 1849, 1866, and 1873, American medical professionals turned their attention to the disease and to India. In medical journals, American physicians described how cholera began at religious festivals in India, traveled across Persia, Russia, Southern Europe, and Western Europe, and ended up following European immigrants to the shores of America. John C. Peters, a New York doctor and former president of the New York uh, Medical Society, wrote about cholera extensively in the late 1860s and into the 1870s. After an outbreak in the United States in 1873, Peters co-authored a report on cholera commissioned by the Surgeon General's office. Peters emphasized the origins of cholera and the festival and religious practices of Hindus. In an article on the origins of cholera in India, he wrote, quote, The extreme point of Sungar Island at the mouth of the Hooghly is believed by some Hindus to mark the junction of the Ganges with the sea. And they accordingly esteem it one of the holiest spots in Bengal, and flock thither every spring in vast numbers, I love thither, for the purpose of bathing and offering sacrifices. There is much reason for the belief that this island was one of the first centers of cholera in 1817. Ritual bathing and sacrifices, Peters argues, provided the perfect storm for cholera outbreaks. Further on in the article, Peters explicitly tied religion to India, uh, to Indian filth, uh, to, sorry, Peter's explicitly tied religion in India, filth, and cholera together. Quote, near a sacred and filthy river it was born, cholera, and at that most sacred and filthy spot on this river, in the delta of the Ganges, for rivers and filth it has subsequently testified a strong regard. Notice that the more sacred it is in Peter's eyes, the filthier it is. And this filthy language is something you see again and again, this, that, that phrase, that word, um, and this connection that the religion is inherently tied to the thing that creates cholera. In contrast to the early missionary reports, Peters presented the problem with Hindu religion in terms of hygiene and health. Hindu religion isn't superstitious, it is filthy. In another article, Peters tracks the spread of cholera from India through Persia into Russia and Southern Europe, and then to Europe, Western Europe and Britain. This is a map that was in the original report, but then Harvard Weekly published second segments of the report, and he is mapping out the spread of cholera throughout the world. Um, again, the disease originated at a religious festival. The disease then spreads throughout India via religious pilgrims leaving Hardwar after the festival and returning home. Hindus spread the disease to their Muslim neighbors, who then carry the disease to Persia through Muslim pilgrimage routes. Uh, the cholera moves from religious routes to commercial ones, spreading along trade routes to the Mediterranean and to Russia, before making its way via steamship or overland trade to Western Europe. Trade, religion, and colonial empire have conspired to spread the disease of the Hindu to the home of the European. The path, though, is not just geographic. It also moves up a hierarchy of cultures popular in the thought of the period. This is from a school textbook, but it uh, divides everyone up in the world up into different groups, the savage, the barbarous, civilized, and, or sorry, we go in order. Savage, barbarous, half-civilized, civilized, and then enlightened. And the line between civilized and enlightened here, any guesses? Protestantism. The civilized are the Catholics in Southern Europe, the enlightened are the Protestants in Britain, and France is kind of a tweener in between, because they're Catholic, but not super Catholic in their eyes, right? There's the enlightenment. There's enough enlightenment people we can say we're French. Um, so, from the superstition, he, superstitious heathen uh, Hindu to the heathen, but at least Abrahamic Muslim, to Southern Europe and the Catholics, or Russia and the Orthodox Church, then to secular but enlightened but still sort of Catholic France, and finally to the 
apex of European culture, enlightened in Protestant Great Britain. Like that's the path the cholera moves. Cholera as, as a disease marked cultural difference and inferiority as it spread from the filthy to the enlightened. When cholera reached America in 1873, Peters took part in the study of where it came from and how it got to America. And having followed, been following all these outbreaks, he was quick uh, to point back to German immigrants arriving in New York and New Orleans in 1873. He wrote, the evidence, although circumstantial, is certainly strong that the unfortunate individuals who contracted cholera came in contact with the poison which had been imported and the effects of immigrants from the cholera-infected districts of Europe. He then had a table that showed most of these immigrants came from Germany. And so the Hindu disease arrived in America as the disease, not of the Hindu, but of the immigrant. Representations of filth, ritual, religion, and immigration coalesced through the work of Peters and other doctors to connect Hindu religion and Catholic immigration. Cholera was a Hindu disease carried to the United States by Catholic immigrants. Hindus in India and Catholics in American cities both lived in filth and poverty. They both engaged in ritual worship. They were both idolaters from the Protestant perspective. So when Protestant Americans critique Hindu superstition and idolatry, they're at the same time critiquing Catholics. To speak of Hindus in 19th century America was also to speak of Catholics. Look no further than Thomas Nast's cartoon, American River Ganges. So remember the woman throwing her baby into the, into the Ganges? Now, instead of a woman throwing a baby, we have a man protecting children. He's got a Protestant Bible in his shirt jacket, so we've got this Protestant pastor protecting children, not chucking them in. And the crocodiles have become bishops, right? Um, there's a lot going on in this cartoon. Uh, you have the uh, political Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican rising up, and also Tammany Hall written across the top of the, front of the Vatican. You have the U.S. public school in crumbles and shambles as these Catholics come in, uh, the American flag being hoisted upside down. And then uh, in the background, you have Lady Liberty being led off to the gallows. Um, so this is the thing that got me thinking about all of this when I saw this cartoon. Because how would an American in 1874, I think that this is from, get this, know what the Ganges is, mm -hmm know why the crocodile, why children and crocodile, like what, how do you get this joke? Or not joke, but whatever this is. Um, but, it, but also I think it, it, it's the greatest evidence for the way that to talk about Hindus is talk about, talk about Indians, talk about Catholics. So throughout the century then, representations of cholera functioned in India, functioned to buttress American identity as rational, moral, Protestant, and white. Okay. Now to my second example, and the last two are shorter. Collar is just a lot there. Uh, my second example. Phrenological studies of Hindu skulls. Yeah. In, 19th century, uh, American in the 19th century, American phrenologists claimed to have discovered the secret to understanding and reforming the essence of a person. The answer lay in a new science, phrenology, which relied upon the empirical act of reading the shape of the human skull. American religious historian Catherine Albanese described the popularity of phrenology in the period. She wrote, Phrenologists map the skull to pursue their work, and reading skull maps and touching various places on the head, bumps in the popular parlance, became an American fashion in and out of the Lyceum halls. In the optimist American reading of the discipline, excesses and deficiencies of faculty or character, as revealed by the bumps, could be remedied. The phrenological early warning system, accompanied by cranial massage, could help change character and so change destiny. Phrenologists expanded their scope beyond the individual, however. <coughs> Races and nations shared cranial features too, and those features explained social and cultural difference. So-called national phrenology reduced all human difference to questions of cranial shape and cranial size. In an 1847 issue of the American Phrenological Journal and Miscellany, which is one of the, the big phrenology journals of the period, uh, Reverend A. E. Burgess attempted to explain Hindu character, and more interesting, interestingly, Hindu religion, through phrenological theory. In an article titled, The Phrenology of the Hindus, Burgess turned to phrenology in order to settle an old dispute over the nature of Hindus. 
Much has been written upon the character of this people, he wrote. Various and conflicting statements have been made respecting them. And his chronological findings would settle things and reach a scientific conclusion. For Burgess, a Protestant missionary who was also interested in this new science, the Hindus, quote, are a very religious people. There's probably no people on earth among whom religion exerts a more extensive influence upon all the relations of life than it does amongst the, these people. Like previous missionaries, uh, according to Burgess, the Hindus, re Hindus' religion derives from their susceptibility to superstition. Quote, Nothing is too absurd to be believed. Many of the most important religious ceremonies are found on the merest vagary of the imagination of some saint. But then he offers a phrenological reason for this superstition. The religious, he says, he writes, The religious character of the Hindus, it appears to me, depends on the combined activity of cautiousness, approbativeness, self-esteem, marvelousness, connected with small conscientiousness and intellectual powers. Each of those qualities are capitalized qualities. They're on this chart, if you look very carefully. Um, match up to a certain organ of the head, believed by phrenologists to be identifiable and measurable. Burgess includes a chart with a measurement of various organs for 15 Hindu heads. So this is... The heads tell him that Hindus are quick to believe things they are told to, slow to change their ways, too proud to change, and inclined to see the world around them with wonder. Hindu religion is literally encoded into the heads of Hindus. An 1867 article by phrenologist Samuel Roberts Wells, titled Hindu Heads and Hindu Characters, makes a distinction between two kinds of Hindus. This is the article here. The high caste Hindu, he writes, is a being of refined and delicate organization, a highly nervous temperament, and beautifully molded features, indicative of gentleness rather than energy, and he is evidently the product of a long existent but decadent civilization. And this is his engraving example of the high caste Hindu. These high caste Aryan Hindus were phrenologically different from the lower caste he described as, quote, such filthy fanatics, low, gross, groveling, ignorant, superstitious, and yet religious. The worst example of these lower Hindus were the fakirs. To prove his point, Wells included a number of engravings. So this is his uh, fakir. So you can see this is sort of, he has the good, <coughs> phrenologically superior, and phrenologically inferior. And he has the measurements he thinks to back this up. True to the reforming spirit of phrenology, the lower Hindus could be reformed. Quote, still they are human beings, capable like others of almost illimitable improvement and development. It must be the work of the long duration to lift them up to the level of our best estate, he wrote. This split between low and high Hindus in Wells' article reflects a popular split in the view Americans held of Hindus in, in India by the 1860s. On the one hand, the missionary representations of Hindu religion as superstition and heathen ritual, those endured. But on the other hand, more liberally minded Americans, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, imagined India as a land of mystical contemplation. This representation of Hindus as philosophical, possessing a high ancient culture, began in the 1820s when New England Unitarians began to read the writings of Vedic philosopher and reformer Ramahun Roy. Roy became quite popular amongst liberal Protestants by the 1830s, and an engraving of his skull is even included in Burgess's phrenology article as an example of the exception that proves the rule. He describes Roy as a convert to Christianity. Right. His his, he was phrenologically destined to become a rational Christian. Transcendentalists after Thoreau and Emerson, uh, I'm going to name a bunch of old, dead, white transcendentalists now, Samuel Johnson, Lydia Maria Child, and James Freeman Clark, continue to represent India as a land of philosophy, unity, and contemplation. Johnson, for example, described India as the brain of the East. Uh, in Clark, James Freeman Clark's Ten Great Religions, his, his argument is that these ten religions on the outside uh, all have a something to give to the one uh, universal religion, which is his form of liberal Unitarian Christianity, which draws on Judaism. But if you look down here at the bottom, you can see he has Brahmanism, which Brahmanism gives to the universal religion a sense of spirit, substance, and unity. So throughout the idea that the East, uh, uh, you can look at Emerson's uh, article on, uh, uh, on Plato, where he describes Plato as being able to balance the unity of the East with the activity of the West. Uh, this is the theme that it's on the on these on this other side that it's uh, full of con contemplative, unified, monistic uh, philosophy. These writers, uh, like Wells, contrasted the great philosophy of India's 
passed with the popular superstition one encountered in contemporary India. Wells offered a phrenological explanation for how superstition and great philosophy could both originate among the same people. It was all in their heads. And one final example that also represented India as a land of ancient wisdom, but that moves us from the 19th century into the turn of the 20th century. The Charaka, the Charaka Club, a group of New York doctors uh, acted as caretakers of the medical profession's ancient history. They named themselves after uh, Charaka, the author of ancient Ayurvedic medical works, and who they saw as the founder of Hindu medicine. The group was founded in 1898 by a number of doctors, and if you look at their uh, published work, the list of papers that they presented at their meetings uh, range in topics from ancient Greek medicine to India to the American Revolution to mind cure, and even one titled Shakespeare's Last Illness, which you guess we all have our last illness. Um, the name, and so when you look at, uh, in the first volume of the club's proceedings, published in 1902, one of the founding members and leaders, Dr. B. Sachs, opens the volume with an article on, uh, called On Hindu Medicine. And when you read the article, what Sachs does is he goes back and finds all of these um, texts in the Ayurvedic system that describe what a good doctor should be like that he should have extensive knowledge, that he should be kind and humble to everyone, he should have, uh, be a clean and neat person, increasing in his knowledge, he should be kind and considerate uh, to his pupils and to his patients, uh, and he should be able to explain the most complicated statements in the simplest and most perspicuous language. Sachs turns to India to find the ancient truths that he believes underlay all good medical practice. And so what he does is, as medicine is modernizing, Sachs goes back to what he sees as the original, earliest form of medicine in India, and finds there the morals he wants his new professionalized doctors to have, in contrast to the quacks and pseudoscientists that he's trying to keep out of medicine. Right? And so there's a way that by taking what he wants from these ancient texts, it gives it a kind of ancient authority. Uh, the ancient Hindu text provided a reminder of the universal moral code all healers needed to adhere to, and the Chakra Club worked to preserve this ancient truth and promote it in a modern context. Thus, the Charaka Club turned to India much the same way as another club formed in New York City, the Theosophical Society, formed in 1875 by Madame Helena Blavatsky and Colonel Henry Steele Olcott. I was making this PowerPoint, and my wife was sitting next to me, and she looked at that picture, and she said, hashtag couple goals. Um, <laughs> the Theosophical Society believed in, believed in an ancient wisdom religion that undergirded all the religions. In her first book, Isis Unveiled, Blavatsky argued that India was the source and home of this ancient wisdom religion, blending their readings of Indian texts with what they believed to be Buddhism, and a little new thought, and a dash of spiritualism. Theosophy grew into a complex system of spiritual self-actualization. India and Hindu religion functioned the same way for both Blavatsky and Sachs. It gave both their projects an ancient authority. They were both doing something new. Blavatsky was a religious entrepreneur and innovator, and Sachs was trying to find morals for this new professionalized field of medicine, and they both looked to ancient India to authorize their projects. Okay, so these three examples have one thing in common. All of this talk about Hindus has more to do with the United States than it does India, which may be an odd thing to conclude at a Center for South Asia. In the past, scholars have read examples like this as encounters between Americans and Hinduism, but such a reading is anachronistic and misleading. None of the writers I've discussed today encountered Hinduism. They encountered a number of things, and they chose to represent to their readers those things in terms of Hindus, idolatry, heathenism, superstition, etc., etc., etc. One could, to return to Allen Ginsberg, try and correct these mispronunciations. But that would miss the point. Asian cholera, the phrenology of the Hindus, and the Charaka Club are examples of how when we over here talk about them over there, we are really talking about ourselves. It's a political and social practice we see every day all around us in America and beyond. But more than that, it goes to a, what I see as a central function of religion. For me, and I think these examples today back this up, religion is a way humans separate us from them. Missionaries and cholera doctors used Hindu religion to separate Hindus and Catholics from American identity. Phrenologists read religious difference into Hindu skulls, and theosophists and Charaka Club doctors use religion in India to find a common wisdom and truth deeper than national difference. 
Whether in the pages of a 19th century magazine or a courtroom, or sorry, whether the pages of a 19th century magazine or in a courtroom in 1968, Americans have used India to argue about the lines between us and them. Thanks. Can somebody put the lights, please?